Hello everyone, in this video we are going to discuss the critical connections in a network problem. In this problem, we are given a number, n, which tells us the number of servers in a network. The servers are numbered from 0 to n-1. We are also given a list of tuples, which represents the connections of the servers. We are guaranteed that for any server, we can reach any other server through a path of connections. A critical connection is a connection where if that connection is removed, it becomes no longer the case that from any server, we can reach any other server through a path. Our job is to identify and return a list of all the critical connections. So for example, if we are given five as N, and this list is our connections list, then our network graph should look something like this. The servers are represented by vertices and the connections are represented by edges. Notice that for this graph, there are two critical connections. I've colored them red. If I remove either of these connections, some servers will become unreachable from other servers. On the other hand, there are three connections that are non-critical. For any of these green connections, if I remove one of them, all these servers can still reach one another. For example, if I remove the connection between 3 and 4, this doesn't change the fact that from server 3, we can take the path from 3 to 2, then to 4, to reach server 4. So in this particular case, the answer we would return is 0, 1, and 1, 2. Now that you hopefully understand the problem, let's discuss an initial solution. I think the first solution is pretty apparent. We can just build the graph, then for every edge in our graph, we can try removing an edge. Then we test if these servers are all still connected to each other via BFS or DFS graph traversal. If some of the nodes are no longer reachable from one another, then we can say that this edge is a critical connection. We then add our removed edge back into the graph and repeat the process on other edges until we have iterated through all the edges. I think this idea is simple enough that I don't really have to go into detail with the explanation or the code. The problem with this solution is that it's too slow. This is because we run DFS or BFS for every edge in the graph. So the time complexity is O of edges times the time it takes for DFS, which is V plus E. So ultimately that is O of E times V plus E. Let's try and come up with a better solution by making a few key observations. We need to figure what makes a connection critical or non-critical. After looking at a few example graphs yourself, you might be able to observe that a connection is critical if and only if it is not part of a cycle in the graph. On the other hand, a connection is non-critical if and only if it is part of a cycle. So we've essentially transformed our problem into a cycle detection problem. If an edge is part of a cycle, it is not critical, and if it is not part of a cycle, then it is critical. This is because when a cycle is formed, we are essentially adding an alternative path to connect any two vertices. So if you look at some cycle like this, by definition of a cycle, there is going to be a path of vertices starting from some vertex A, which goes back into itself vertex A. If we pick any two vertices in the cycle, a starting vertex Vs and a destination vertex Vd, there are always going to be two paths which we can use to go from our source to our destination. Notice how there are no overlapping edges shared between these two paths. So either an edge belongs in path 1 or it belongs in path 2. This means that none of the edges in a cycle are necessary because if you remove an edge in path 1, you can use path 2 to still go from the source to destination. And if you remove an edge from path 2, then you can use path 1 to go from source to destination as well. Take a moment to pause the video and really understand this idea because it is the core idea behind why, if an edge or a connection is part of a cycle, then it is not a critical connection. Okay, hopefully now that you agree with me about this, as I said earlier, we can rethink of this problem as a cycle detection problem. We need to identify which edges are part of a cycle and which are not, and then return the ones that are not. To do this, we are going to use depth first search along with timestamps. As we perform our DFS, we make a timestamp of when we visit each node, 
So for example here, if we start with vertex 3, we would mark it with timestamp 1. Then our DFS would take us to vertex 2, so we would mark it with the parent node's timestamp plus 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. When we move to vertex 1, the timestamp is 2 plus 1, which is 3. And when we get to vertex 0, it would have a timestamp of 4. The way we can use timestamps to identify cycles is if we encounter a timestamp that is lower than the current node in our traversal, then we know that all the edges in this traversal are a part of a cycle. So for example, if there was an edge connecting the 0 to the 3, then we explore vertex 3 from vertex 0. Vertex 0 has a timestamp of 4 and vertex 3 has a lower timestamp of 1. When we encounter a timestamp that is lower than the current one, it means that on our current path of exploration with DFS, we are now encountering a vertex which we have already explored, and this means that we have found a cycle, so all the edges in this cycle are not critical. This is the general idea of our solution. Let's create some pseudocode and trace through some examples to make things more clear. So we can start off with an example of just a line. Every connection in this example is critical, so that is what we are hoping this algorithm will detect. The main part of our algorithm is the DFS, and it is going to take in three parameters. V, which is the current vertex under exploration. Parent, which is where the recursive call for V was made from and current timestamp, which is the timestamp that this vertex was explored at. We can start the algorithm at any vertex, but to keep things simple, let's just start at vertex 0. When we make our initial call from the main function, the current vertex is 0, there is no parent, so we'll just leave that as null, and the timestamp starts off at 1. We can store the timestamps in a dictionary called timestamps, where the key of the dictionary is the vertex number and the value is the timestamp. For every one of the neighbors, if the neighbor is not yet visited, we visit it, passing in the neighbor as the new current vertex, the current vertex as the new parent, and we increment the timestamp by one. So then in our recursive call for the one vertex, which is the neighbor of the zero, we would get one as the vertex, zero as the parent, and 2 as the current timestamp. You should be able to see how the next two calls for 2 and 3 are going to go. Okay, at this point we have explored every vertex and we need to somehow decide if a connection is critical. We said from earlier that if we encounter a timestamp which is earlier than the current one, it means that there is a cycle. Just look at this example here on the left with a cycle to compare. When there is a cycle, there would be an extra call from the 3 vertex to the 0 vertex, and we would encounter a timestamp of 1, which is lower. Ultimately, the solution is trying to differentiate between these two cases. So if the timestamp of the neighbor is greater than the current timestamp, then the connection from V to the neighbor is a critical connection. Also, for the cycle detection to propagate up the recursive stack, we need to update the timestamp of the current explored vertex to be the minimum of its timestamp and all of its neighbors. So you can see on the left example with the cycle, the timestamp of the three vertex, after it makes a call to the zero vertex, it will be updated to be the minimum of the existing timestamp four and the timestamp of the neighbor, which is one. So this timestamp becomes one. One caveat to this rule is we need to ignore lower timestamps, which come from the parent vertex that this vertex is being called from. This is because the parent vertex is always going to have a lower timestamp than the current vertex, and we don't want to consider this as a detected cycle. To handle this, we add in an if condition, where if the neighbor we are exploring is the parent, we continue to the next iteration of the for loop. Let's now backtrack through both these examples to see how the cycle detection works. At this point in time, the new timestamp of vertex 3 is a 1, after having found the 0 vertex as a neighbor for the cycle case on the left. For the non-cycle case on the right, this connection does not exist, so the timestamp remains a 4. When the recursive call is finished, we backtrack to vertex 2, where the call was made. At this point, we move down to the if statement. For the case on the left with the cycle, 
the if condition fails because the timestamp of the neighbor, vertex 3, with a timestamp of 1, is lower than the current timestamp of 3. Furthermore, the timestamp value of vertex 2 gets updated to the minimum of the existing timestamp and the neighbor, which is 3 versus 1, so the minimum is 1. For our example on the right without the cycle, the if condition passes because the timestamp of the neighboring vertex 3 is 4, which is greater than the current timestamp of 3. So we identify V to neighbor, which is the 2 to 3 connection, as a critical connection. I'll color it red. And next, the timestamp of vertex 2 becomes the minimum of the existing timestamp and the timestamp of the neighbor, which is 3 versus 4, so that stays at 3. Next, we move back up the recursive stack to vertex 1. For our example on the left, the if condition fails because the timestamp of the neighbor, vertex 2, is 1, which is not greater than the current timestamp of 2. We also update the timestamp dictionary for this vertex to be the minimum of it and the neighbor to propagate the fact that we have detected a cycle, so our timestamp dictionary goes from 2 to 1. For the case without a cycle, the timestamp of the neighbor, vertex 2, is 3, which is larger than the current timestamp, so the edge from V to neighbor, which is 1 to 2, gets marked as a critical connection. Also, the value in the timestamp dictionary remains the same because we take the minimum of 2, which is the existing value, and 3, the value of the neighbor, and the lower of these two is the existing value of 2. Finally, when the recursive stack makes it back to the zero vertex, the code paths are pretty much the same. For the example with the cycle, the neighbor's timestamp is not larger than the current timestamp, so it doesn't get marked as a critical connection. On the other hand, for the right example, the neighbor's timestamp is 2, which is larger than the 1 of the existing timestamp, so that does get marked as a critical connection. For both examples, the timestamps stay at 1. That's it for tracing this example. I'm going to trace through one more example, which both has a cycle as well as a critical connection. If you think you understand the pseudocode at this point, feel free to skip past this section. But because I had a hard time understanding this solution initially, I think going through another example might be worth it. So to start off, we make an initial call to any vertex, but I'm just going to start at zero. So for our zero node, our call has these values as their parameters, and the timestamp is 1 to start off. Now we iterate through every neighbor of this vertex. The only neighbor this vertex 0 has is the 1 vertex. For this call, the if statement is false, as vertex 1 is not the parent of vertex 0. However, this neighbor is unvisited, so we make a recursive call. After the recursive call is made, vertex 1 gets assigned to a timestamp of 2, so I'm going to add a red 2 next to the 1 vertex. The 1 vertex has 3 neighbors. It doesn't matter which one we explore first. Let's just go with the 2. The 2 vertex is not a parent, so we once again make a recursive call with the current timestamp of 2 plus 1. The 2 vertex gets a timestamp of 3, and at this point I'm going to skip a little ahead to vertex 4. Make sure that the two new recursive calls I've skipped make sense to you, but at this point we are going to explore one of Vertex 4's three neighbors, Vertex 1. Both the if and elif condition fail for this neighbor because Vertex 1 is not the parent from which Vertex 4 is being explored, and it also has already been visited. This has us move down to the if statement. In this case, the neighbor's timestamp, which is a 2, is lower, so the if statement fails. This signals to us that we have detected a cycle, and this connection is not a critical connection, because from this node, we can reach another node which we have already visited at an earlier timestamp. In practical terms, the cycle we have detected is the one I've highlighted in green. Like in our earlier example, in order for the earlier nodes to know that we have run into a cycle, we need to set the timestamp V to the min of the neighbor and the current timestamp. In this case, this is the min between 5 and 2, which is 2. Next, we move on to the next iteration of the for loop for the neighbor vertex 5. This neighbor is not a parent, rather it is unvisited, so we need to make another recursive call and explore it. It passes the current timestamp, which is 5, 
plus one, which makes it six, to the next recursive call. So six is assigned as the timestamp for vertex five. For vertex five, the only neighbor it has is vertex four, which was its parent, so we continue on. Since that was the only neighbor, it means that the recursive call is popped and we move back to the recursive call of vertex four. In this call, we had just made the DFS call to vertex five, so now we move down and check if the timestamp of the neighbor, vertex 5, is larger than the current timestamp. This evaluates to true because the neighboring timestamp is 6, which is greater than the current timestamp variable, which is 5. So we deem v to neighbor a critical connection, which is our connection from vertex 4 to 5. The timestamp dictionary value for vertex 4 stays the same, because we are giving it the min of the existing, which is two, and the neighbor, which is six, and the smaller of those is two. The final neighbor we explore is vertex three, but this is the parent vertex from which vertex four was explored from, so we continue and skip the last iteration. Since that was the last neighbor to explore, we pop the recursive call and move back to vertex three. There, we had just finished calling DFS on vertex 4. So now we check if the timestamp of the neighbor, which is 2, is greater than the current timestamp, which is 4. It is not, so the if condition fails. Next, timestamp of v gets assigned to the min of the current timestamp value 4 and the neighbor's value 2. So timestamp v gets changed to 2. In the next and final iteration, the neighbor is the parent, so we skip that iteration and we move back up the recursive stack to where vertex two called vertex three. There we see that the if condition fails because the timestamp of the neighbor is two, which is not greater than the current timestamp of three. The timestamp dictionary value of this vertex gets changed to two because that is the min between the current value and the neighbor timestamp. We now move on to the next iteration, which explores the parent as the neighbor. So we skip this iteration with the continue statement. Since that was the last neighbor to explore, we once again pop the recursive stack and move back up to vertex one. There we had just finished exploring vertex two. For this neighbor, the if condition fails because the timestamp of the neighbor two is not larger than the current timestamp of two. So the value stays the same at two. On the next iteration, we explore the next neighbor vertex four this neighbor is not the parent, so the first if condition fails. This neighbor has also already been visited, so the LF condition fails. So we jump down to the comparison with the current timestamp, and that also fails. And the min assignment doesn't do anything, so the timestamp remains at 2. For the third neighbor of vertex 1, this is the parent, so we skip the iteration with the continue statement. And we jump back to our very first recursive call, which was from vertex 0 calling vertex 1. Finally here, the if condition passes because the timestamp of the neighbor, vertex 1, is larger than the current timestamp of this vertex 0. Since the if condition passes, it means we have identified that v to neighbor is a critical connection, so I've colored this connection red. Timestamps of v remains at 1 because it is the min of the current value of the neighbor, so that completes the original call, so the algorithm is finished running. You can see how the solution has successfully identified the two critical connections, the one between vertex 0 and 1, and the other between vertex 4 and 5. Now that I have traced through two examples with pseudocode, hopefully you have a better idea of the algorithm. Let's look at how the actual Python code would look for a complete solution. So the main function where the solution starts off at is critical connections, we are given a list of edges in the variable called connections and n, which represents the amount of vertices numbered from zero to n minus one. The first thing we do is build a graph. This part of the solution just creates a dictionary where the key is a vertex and the value is a list of vertices this vertex is connected to. This is an adjacency list representation of a graph. Then we initialize the timestamps dictionary which we will be using to keep track of each vertices timestamp. They all start off at negative one as a dummy value, which symbolizes a vertex that has not been visited because it doesn't have a timestamp yet. We also initialize a list called critical, 
This is our list of critical connections, which will ultimately be the final answer that we return. Next, we pick a vertex called starting, which is where we start our DFS. This can be any vertex. In my solution, I've chosen the first vertex in the first edge given to us from the connections parameter. Now we make our initial call to the DFS algorithm. The DFS function in our actual code is very similar to the one in the pseudocode, so I don't need to be redundant and explain all of it. Some of the differences though are it takes in a few extra variables as parameters. These are the graph, which is the adjacency list graph representation of our connections network. It takes in timestamps, which is our dictionary to keep track of each vertices timestamps. And it also takes in our critical list, which will hold all the critical connections identified. The second difference is in the elif statement to identify if a vertex has been visited we check if the timestamp is negative one, as this is the default value of a timestamp for a vertex, and it indicates that it hasn't been visited yet. The third difference is that once we identify a connection is critical, we have to store it by appending that edge to our critical list. Again, because I think the real code is pretty close to the pseudocode, I don't think I need to go into any more detail, and we can just move on to the time and space at this point. The time and space is pretty straightforward as it's literally just the complexity required to execute DFS. As you probably already know, DFS has both a time and space complexity of V plus E. If we let V be the number of vertices and E be the number of edges. Okay, that is it for this solution. This problem is pretty hard, at least in my opinion. So it might require you to read through the solution a couple times and trace through some more examples on your own before you fully get it. Regardless, I hope this video at least helps out a little bit. Thank you for watching and good luck on all your interviews.